Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Melissa Raymer. I am the Education and Art Librarian at UNC Wilmington. Um, and today is our session on Swimming with Floaties Isn't Just for Kids, reorienting, reorienting Adult Learners to Data and Information Literacy. And then my colleague, Lenny Argabray, too. <clears throat> so the context of this presentation, um, basically the background to why I created a Canvas course um, came about due to the many consultations I was getting from a course um, EDL 596 called Culminating Project One. I was going over basic information literacy skills before I could provide guidance on the individual topic. Um, these students have been out of school for a while and they had a spectrum of research skills. Um, I wasn't embedded in any particular course except for EDL 596. Um, so I did not work with many students until the end of the master's program. As for the ED, the EDD program, I have been in a few courses there um, to introduce resources and research at UNC Wilmington. A lot of the courses in the educational leadership EDL master's program are dual listed for master's and ED, EDD level students, but the course content is mainly focused on the EDD level. Um, the EDL students have to do specific data research projects that require them to have IRB certification. And then also um, for the students that haven't met me or Lenny, um, there's a student, co student cohorts groups um, where they share information out in the program. Um, and so it's a really word of mouth. And that's how a lot of them do find out about us in the library um, to gaining help if the faculty haven't promoted us. And then the kind of proposed solution that I came up with was um, creating the Canvas course and pilot it in the EDL department because it has the doctoral program. Um, it does cover remedial skills, so class time is instruction isn't interrupted. It, in, it in now includes data literacy with the new functional expert data librarian, Lenny Argabright, that we have hired. Um, the course does not replace liaison or functional expert instruction or consultations or workshops. The logistics of it is it's a voluntary self-enrollment um, to the course for the entirety of the degree. It's something they can refer to um, once they start the program and they have access to it until they finish the program. Um, faculty promote the um, course um, through their syllabi or a class assignment. Um, also, for the new EDD cohort coming in each fall, um, it's recommended that they enroll in it during the summer so they can review the content, uh, familiarize themselves with what is in the um, Canvas course so they can review it, use it as they're um, going through the program. So Melissa had created a list of learning objectives, like all of us good librarians do. Um, and this is um, the learning objectives that came that she came up with. Um, it it starts with you know defining what scholarly is and um, identifying components of scholarly sources, bringing up peer review, what sources you could go to, um, how to actually access full text, recommending certain databases, what is a search strategy, um, and then of course like citing APA citations. Um, when she asked me to get involved um, to add in some data, I started thinking about what are some remedial type data skills that would be very valuable for adults coming back to school to have because they likely haven't really worked with data before. Um, they likely, like many people, find data overwhelming and don't even know where to start. So I thought about like, okay, if you're at any point in your data career at um, in your program, um, what are some areas that could take up extra time for a teacher to have to back up and cover? Um, maybe like they are not taking their research methods class and so they haven't covered all of those things that a research methods class might cover, you know, like what is um, 
nominal interval ratio or those sort of explanations of what data is. Maybe um, it doesn't cover like what survey data collection is. So I was just thinking about what could be valuable data components to include and add into a course, a module course like this. Um, so I, after thinking about that, um, what I ended up with was um, I think six extra pages that were data related. And I added um, to the learning objectives that Melissa had. And I've highlighted here what those learning objectives were. De not, define not just scholarly scholarship, but also define what data is. And in defining what data is, I decided to include examples of data in research. What is qualitative data versus quantitative data? you know, introduce or reintroduce nominal or null interval ratio data, and also bring up what raw and aggregated data is, just so that they can be aware of these sort of differences of what data can even be in the first place. Um, other sort of introducting, introductory things I included was uh, like how to break down what is a table or what is a graph? How do I even read one of those sort of things? And I show examples, especially Especially that are education related. Um, and like with citing sources in APA, how about citing data in APA, whether that is citing a statistic or citing a table or citing, you know, a graph or citing something that you found in a data database versus something that you found in a research article that was data related. How would you do that in APA? Here are some sources, here are some examples. Um, here's an example of uh, one of my data pages. Obviously, it's not the actual thing, um, but I broke down what uh, what I covered in that page. Um, and I wanted to, this was about how to read data tables. So I wanted to explain how you actually read a data table, how you actually read a data set. What is involved in the first place? Well, there are columns, there are rows, there are variables, there are values, and this is where they are. And in a super basic, like, look, here's the picture. Uh, and if I wanted to find a person's age, this is where I would look. Um, and then I deconstruct what what is involved in actually getting that comprehension level. Um, so I included a example data set from like the civil rights data set, I think of, um, of um, types of students in STEM who were taking them at our local public schools. Um, and I asked a couple of questions like, what is the title? What, what are the variables? Where, when was this source collected, this data collected, these sort of things that you want to think about while you are looking at a data set. Um, and I gave sample answers to these questions just to introduce people to the concept that um, you, you would, things that you should be thinking about when you're looking at a data set. So, um going about implementing the course, um, before I started designing the course to see if it was even going to be a valuable tool resource, um, I did kind of um, talk with a couple of faculty that I'm, I'm kind of close with in the, in the program, um, just kind of get a feel what they thought, and they were supportive of the idea. So the timeline was um, in this uh, 2021 summer fall, I created information literacy topics in the Canvas shell. Um, in 2021 fall, the intent was to introduce it to the department, but I got bumped the entire semester. And so basically I attended in 2022 spring, the January department meeting and introduced the Canvas course as the information literacy, again, remedial information literacy skills um, to get the buy-in as a department. They were all supportive. Um, gave them the and self-enrolled link to go ahead and start putting into their spring syllabi, share it with their students. Um, and then uh, in after, you know, in introducing it, um, also, I didn't personally introduce it to the students. It was just the faculty. So there was some, 
as the statement above, the poor engagement awareness it's like students were given this link without any context behind it. So there was some, there is still some confusion of um, what it is. But um, when Lenny was hired and I decided, hey, Lenny, I think we could really build upon this and make it more rich and, you know, a better source. Um, again, because depending on the courses that they're taking, you know, sometimes they're, um, they don't have background and data um, and it might also help them if they're a little confused of what the faculty are talking about with data and how to read data and find data and all that. So again, just um, asked her and invited her to create this data literacy portion of the Canvas module. And so in fall, this past fall, 2022, um, we did have a faculty um, that I swear was in the January 2022 department meeting, but she reached out to Lenny and I and said, I'm not sure, like, I don't remember this, but this is a great tool. How can I help you guys? And so she embedded it into her course this fall. And so um, that was the first real, the you know, class group of students. It's a good sample um, that were able to test it. And it was an EDL 523. So it was a master's level course. Three minute warning. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that feedback that we have gotten so far. As this is a voluntary module, we do see EDL students self-enrolling. And so far, there are 65 students and 10 faculty enrolled. They really haven't done anything within the shell yet, though, but that's fine. Um, we did, however, get more concentrated use from a test in that course Melissa was talking about. Um, this faculty member was data intensive. Um, she taught many data classes um, and we both previously worked with her. I had asked her to give feedback on my data, um, my data pages. Um, she had 12 students in her class uh, review the material and respond to three reflective questions. This class was a low level class in the EDL program called Research and Education, in which students are intended to develop various research competencies such as research design and data interpretation and reporting, many other things that are not data related, um, often involved in educational decision making. They wouldn't actually be collecting data or deeply learning how to analyze data, but this process would be simulated for their introduction in the class. And the students looked through the, the Canvas module early in the class semester. Um, the majority of them responded about the information literacy components of our Canvas shell, but here are a few quotes that we found that brought up the data pages. And um, I won't read them, um, but we do have our slides available for you to look at after the fact. Mostly they, they talk about it at large rather than specific parts within the data pages um, that they wanted to express. Um, they also, APA seems more relevant, um, easy to understand in the first place. So they do bring up citing tables and figures, which is helpful. After receiving their feedback, Melissa and I came together and reviewed what this meant for our work. We were honestly not surprised about the feedback quality, both in the small amount of feedback related to data and in the sparse suggestions that they gave for improvements. This is because the test occurred so early in the semester and in such an early graduate class that they likely haven't yet encountered much course connection. So our material wasn't meaningful or relevant yet. Examining and understanding data can often not even come up in adult professional life and isn't traditionally covered in academic courses unless it's a data specific course. So the students met the data pages of the module as one huge beast. Um, so at their point in their career, they may remark simply that the whole page about data was new to them. Um, I'm going to skip to Melissa's page next. So basically the next steps is just trying to get more continue to get additional feedback, continue to try, try to get into um, other courses, maybe scaffold the modules in the Canvas course, help faculty identify when to provide what content, you know, during their, um, during the courses throughout the program, um, and try to actually us to, to physically introduce it and to give it a little bit more you know, context and, you know, also introduce them to us that we exist 
um, instead of always finding out later in the program, find out early. So again, as they're going through the program, they can think about when they need us and can um, you know, help focus on what they, their needs are at the time instead of trying to do this kind of remedial that's covered. So, um, and just continue to revise the course. So, yeah, thank you. Time for questions, great timing. Do we have questions from the audience? Uh, please put them in the Q&A or in the chat. There were a lot of chats already saying how, how great and informative, useful, realistic, and beautifully designed mm -hmm. your talk was. Um, and it's, it makes sense that you weren't surprised. I'm going to ask a question, taking my privilege as the talking head. Um, how was, how did you feel Canvas and making it a, an optional kind of module for people, how did that whole process work? Um, just being the formal, like a formal distance learning librarian and just being aware of, of how Canvas can be used, not, you know, for instruction, but also not like literal credited course instruction. You know, I reached out to um, instructional designers on campus and just talk through my ideas, trying to figure out if it was a good platform. Um, and just that there are the nice tools we could throw in quizzes, just again, to kind of help if we want with, you know, promotion. Again, we can get analytics and data from it um, and set up surveys or feedback. Um, but we just created a developmental shell. So it, it doesn't um, necessarily time out, you know, it'll be just there and um, and having the ease of the self-enrollment of just providing a URL, like a permalink URL to the course, and then they just enroll. We can also manually enroll. And then changing the roles of faculty. We want faculty in it because I did tell them, this is also your course too. You know, I want this to be, you know, a, a group effort, a team effort. Um, because they're the ones teaching the content and the course, and we just want to make sure we're also supporting that um, and that we're not providing information that is not necessary, or we are we being redundant, um, because that was some of the redundancy that we kept getting. But again, you know, it's okay to refer back to things as you're going through, so you have those connections throughout, you know, the, the course. So regarding using Canvas also, um, you know, it's something that um, would be roll outable, scalable. Um, so I have made a separate development um, Canvas shell where I can make different versions of my data pages so that there's an education version, there's a, you know, biology version, whatever, nursing version um, with different data examples relevant to the different lessons that I want to cover. And I can make these different things public so that any person, any, you know, faculty, if they found it or were um, told about it, they could easily adapt that into their own Canvas class shell, or it could be quickly put into a different, you know, uh, type of orientation course like Melissa made for one of the other library liaisons, um, something like that. So it felt and perhaps even beyond UNCW, it could be made public enough to like be, you know, copied and, and revised and things like that. So I think Canvas was sort of advantageous for, for its reproducibility. Yeah, either creating the course or creating modules that you could put in that Canvas, Canvas Commons area that again could be campus-wide, university-wide or beyond since Canvas is a highly used, you know, program. LMS. Mm -hmm. Great. And we've got a number of comments of people who are really looking forward to looking at the slides in the OSF and uh, using parts, parts of your uh, strategy for their own. 